You are listening to Cemetery Confessions, the world's number one goth talk podcast. And I now have a full glass of spiced rum, so I think we're good to go. Uh, all right, hello and welcome to episode 39 of Cemetery Confessions. This month, we have Lygia Resurrected from YouTube on, as well as Michelle from, you know, the, the Internet's uh, Queen of Goth. And we're going to discuss the history of Gothic literature, its connection to the Goth subculture, and how... Um, the goth subculture has been shaped over time by the gothic. In addition to that, we're going to be discussing the history of goth fashion and the influence of mainstream fashion trends on goth fashion trends. And then finally, we are reviewing the new album from Drab Majesty. So as always, I am the Count, and I am here with my co-host, Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello there. And we have Michelle, lovely Michelle. Hello. Hey, thanks for coming on again. Always a pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. Thank uh, you bef- for keeping inviting me back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, before we jump into the news here real quick, I'd had a couple housekeeping items uh, related to the Belfry Network. The first of which is we just added a new podcast to the Belfry that is uh, called Necromancy Radio. This is run by... Uh, the Green Widow out of Australia, and it's a relatively new show. Uh, it's an interview-based show, something that we don't have already, but basically she brings on uh, different goths. She's had YouTubers, musicians, artists, um, authors, a, a whole bunch of, a whole slew. Uh, her first episode was with uh, DJ... Oh, TJ Cruel Britannia. Cruel Britannia. That's what it, that's his name. That um, was a good one. I'm really enjoying one. those. Oh, you checked it out. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've listened to almost all of them. I have a very boring job. <laughs> <laughs> it so is, thank it you is great. It is content. great to listen to. <laughs> yes, it is wonderful. And I appreciate it because I don't have to listen to myself talk for, <laughs> for however long I can listen to somebody else talk about stuff. So if you guys haven't checked it out, uh, Necromancy Radio, you can find it on the belfry.rip, which is the website, of course. Uh, you can look up the Belfry on your podcast app if that's how you get it if you have android you can download the belfry app which will have all of the shows from the network on there uh but yeah it's a good time so check that out also i just wanted to mention we have uh been trending up in downloads we've i'm assuming we have a bunch of new listeners if you're new to the show uh if you're just here to listen to something specific if you look at the show notes i have timestamps for each segment of the show so if there's something you specifically want to listen to if you're using the app you can actually click on the timestamp and it will jump to that part of the show it, it's kind of a quality of life thing it's something most people don't know about so if you're just here for something specific uh use the timestamps. otherwise i just wanted to briefly say cemetery confessions is a podcast where we talk about goth stuff we review music we talk about movies uh usually each episode we tackle a specific topic if you want to go back through the back catalog, what I like to do is look at the titles of each episode and see what seems interesting. Um, so if anyone's new, thanks for hanging out with us. We're going to go ahead and jump into the news. If this boy did this and the gothic you know, stuff that went around it and the motive and everything, don't we all sort of want to know... That could be our teenager. That could be our kid doing that. How, how could that possibly happen? Being described as being involved with the goth movement, but uh, what exactly is that? We kind of know it when we see it, but uh, <laughs> some aspects of a goth lifestyle provoke. Could they provoke such a murder? It was weird that she deleted her post, and I'm not sure why. I think she might have deleted her Tumblr because oh. if you look at the background, or maybe she changed the URL because if you look at the background image, like on your desktop, it does not look like something a goth would put. Like it's almost like a nature scene. It's weird. So I wonder if she like maybe just changed her URL. Mine looks fine. I don't know how to use Tumblr, so I don't know. 
Oh, yeah. So but, I know. Uh, I'm like the only person who's like still clinging to Tumblr. <laughs> What's a Tumblr? Uh, this article comes from a poster we've had on the show several times before, kind of trending towards the contentious side of uh, goth blogging, and that is... Who is this? What is her name again? Sandra I have, von Ruin. I have the gothic Alice up. Yeah, Sandra no, no, von Ruin. Sa- Sandra von Ruin. Uh, someone who makes wonderful web comics. Uh, Adorable. So yeah, cute. Really cute. I agree. Uh, but has some interesting opinions about uh, goth culture. So we're going to jump into one of those here. And this one is titled uh, Goth versus Mainstream Over 40 Years. So she starts by saying, It's always kind of bothered me a bit that some goths like to really dump on modern goth styles and trends, when in retrospect, goth has always mirrored the mainstream in terms of fashion in some point or another. Right from the very beginning, goth was borrowing from the mainstream and vice versa, so I thought that I would break down four decades of goth fashion and their comparisons to popular trends and mainstream fashion to show that goth uh, goth has never been as original as you might think, and that change in evolution is inevitable in all subcultures that involve fashion. Of course, we know goth came from punk, so obviously uh, from the very moment goth stood on its two legs, it has already been borrowing style inspiration from its punk roots, but it didn't stop there. So before we go on, there's a few things there. Uh, Well, of course it's going to borrow from mainstream fashion. I mean... But that doesn't that doesn't mean that what did she say? Like it's not as original or innovative as you might think. I mean I I don't agree with that. I think it is quite original and innovative, but just because in there are some elements uh, of mainstream fashion that it takes its cue from, that doesn't mean that it's you know, unoriginal. Yeah, I, there's a couple things happening here. Uh, she's, I think the implication for dumping on modern trends is pastel goth and new goth. And so I think she's trying to make an argument for their legitimacy. And then there's also this idea that I, I think kind of implicit in what she was saying that there's a emphasis on fashion. Uh, and this is something that I've been seeing actually popping up recently in online comments about people arguing <clears throat> about how there's too much of an emphasis on how people look and how people dress. And it should only be about it's kind of the age old thing, but it's coming back up again. I've seen recently people arguing about mainstream YouTubers, goth YouTubers that only care about how they look and only care about hauls and that kind of thing. And then got the argument that it doesn't you shouldn't have to dress in a certain way i think uh the you know like we've said the problem with pastel goth and new goth is that it's not necessarily how they look it's that they have nothing to do with goth they don't yes they're not connected to the music they're not connected to the culture uh there's borrowing the word and then borrowing some of the aesthetics but There's no other connection there. And the connection with the fashion is pretty tenuous in my opinion. So you guys can give your your thoughts on that. But like I've said, goth is kind of a homology in that it's a uh, amalgam of different ephemera, different uh, values, different uh, venerated norms. Right. So it's not just fashion. It's not just music. Uh, so the the thing that I see with new goth and pastel goth is that it's it, that's all it is. It's fashion. It's all yeah. it's only how you look. Uh, and and I don't think you can to take the word goth and to throw it in there and then to, to make an argument for those being part of the goth culture, I think is disingenuous because it's not, there's more to goth. Even if you don't necessarily want to agree that there's a world, you have to have a worldview to be goth or you have to have a, a particular mindset is another popular phrase uh, to be goth. There is still more to the culture than just how you dress. And I don't think the argument against new goth and pastel goth is because they're incorporating other elements 
and that you 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 can't be goth if you have pink hair or something like that. It's because all they care about is the fashion. My only qualm with pastel goths is that they use the word goth. I mean, if they were just called pastels or something, I'd have no problems. I mean, they can do what they want, but I just I don't appreciate them using right goth and i know we've talked about this a million times uh any any thoughts michelle or i'll jump into the yeah i mean i i don't think that yeah i mean i can't believe we're still it's 2017 (laughs) and we're still talking about pastel goth like Uh, i I don't don't know but but yeah i mean i mean to to say that there is not a visual aspect and a visual aesthetic to the subculture you can't say that of course there is but right. that is not all we are right i mean if you look at what we're going to talk about on this show 300 year old literature is coming into play yeah for, for a lot of us i mean for me definitely yeah. yeah i mean i know i'm not saying you have to read the mysteries of adolfo to be goth but for a lot of us that whole whole aspect of it it's part and parcel it it seeps into every aspect not just your clothes right yeah it's 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 uh it's part of what makes goth not the only part part of what makes goth unique is that it's substantive uh it's not just the kind of uh vapid fashion trend or something something else that the mainstream would use academics study goth they argue about goth they right. argue about uh, subculture We've been history. arguing about goth. Yeah, this is the 39th <laughs> episode of arguing exactly. about goth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, um, and each right. argument I, gets I, more heated. I think I think the three of us that we have right now are a little bit of an echo chamber, but yeah. maybe not. <laughs> well, but see, I mean, even so, I've I, I think I've asked a lot of guests this about: uh, Do you see pastel goths or new goths or health goths in? clubs or in the community the goth community and people have said yes but the statistically this is not scientific at all but from the people i've asked on this show is vanishingly small it's it's almost not yeah and i mean it depends on what you do i mean not that long ago i went to see crystal castles back when alice glass was still in the band and they were still good (laughs) and yeah you had a lot of people there in that new goth style but if you go to a pointed goth event, you know, something geared toward just the goths, you don't really see those people. Right. Right. Unless you want to call health goths the people see, who and now I've, have I've seen... Converse and t shirts. <laughs> yeah. But that you know, I don't think that's actually health goth. I think that's just T shirts. Right. Well, no, yeah, I've exactly. I've seen some people try to make the argument it's kind of a uh uh, what's the term? Not retrospective, but the opposite of that argument, where they try to claim uh, people who have been dressing similar to a new goth style, right? Uh, you're you're but retconning around, it, like exact retconning, yeah. exactly. Yeah, where yeah, they're saying, oh well, they're new goth, but they've actually been dressing like that for the last twenty years and going to clubs or whatever that's been around for the last twenty years. Uh, but now because there's this new label, they're saying that's the thing, but it, they're actually not related to that, you know. So right. I mean, if you look at to to go back to the infamous 40 years of goth video <laughs> if you look at the the last look i think it was the last look in the women's one which was new goth yeah. which was leggings ankle boots and a flowy top yeah i've been wearing that outfit for 25 years yeah. Yeah. you know i mean <laughs> it's yeah. it's not a new thing no but it but it just it Michelle, looks it says it, new it, seems it says new, new in the word it says n u and yeah, ooh, so it's new, it's like new metal. It's cool now. That's, that's the oh, hip God. the hip way of spelling new. <laughs> oh, I can't like new believe metal. Why new metal is new so metal. bad. <laughs> that's where they put like that's the only other place I know people spell n u for new. It's I can't believe new metal is so bad. I can't believe they would want. Didn't to use there it. used to be an '80s band called New Shoes and it was like n u and then s h o o z s h o o z. Yep. Oh my God. That's really hip. Whoa. All right, I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on or I'm going to get angry. Okay. 
80s style. The 80s are known uh, as a pretty outrageous time for fashion, and with pop music dominating the radio and television, it was understandable that pop stars were a huge influence when it came to fashion. Madonna was definitely one of the most influential icons of the 80s, and though she was a pop princess on the radio, some of her style often dabbled in the darker side of fashion. She often sported fishnet tops, black leather, and religious symbols. Much like Susie Sue, leather, spandex, lace, and pointy shoes were all trendy in the 80s, but not just in goth. Much of the mainstream as well. Makeup was often bold in color and almost uh, almost geometric in shape. And of course, who could forget the hair? Goths in the 80s went all out when it came to their hairstyles, but they weren't the only ones wasting a whole can of Aquanet in one day on keeping their hair gravity-defying. Almost everyone in the 80s at some point has backcombed, teased, or crimped their locks, all in the name of biggest hair. Okay. I can, I don't have an argument here. I don't I don't yeah I don't get what she's really arguing. Is she saying that because Madonna was more popular that like goth uh musicians and goths during that time were copying from her? Or she was copying from us. Or and yeah, or if Madonna it's the other way is around. A, Madonna is a notorious I, I don't want to say thief because that makes it sound Right. I, I don't. I don't mean it in that way because I actually really love Madonna in that era. I was mm-hmm. actually a Madonna for third grade Halloween. Oh wow! Fun fact <laughs> from like the the like a virgin era. How my mother let me do that, I don't know. Um, but hey, good thing we were Catholic. We had tons of rosary beads around the house. Right. Um, but I mean, yeah. If you look back, I mean, she had amazing style. There is not an outfit she was wearing in Desperately Seeking Susan that I wouldn't wear right now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I don't necessarily know that goth was taking from her, but she was taking a little bit from goth. And, you know, yeah, leather, spandex, lace, pointy shoes, these, yeah, they were all trendy in the 80s. You could go to the mall and pre-Hot Topic and build yourself a very decent goth-looking wardrobe. And they're still trendy now. I mean, that's that's kind of the fallacy here is that you're taking the most salient of the era, Madonna. She was the huge pop star, but that doesn't necessarily mean you attribute the fashion, you know, which way does it go, right? It's it's. I mean, if you want to make the argument that it's a zeitgeist, maybe, but goth fashion in the 80s was... There was a lot of uh, uh, appropriate... There was a lot of shopping at thrift stores. So there was a right. lot of appropriation of past subcultures being made into a darker, more morose kind of macabre aesthetic. So it wasn't, I, I think it's, I mean, maybe it's kind of the chicken and the egg argument, but uh, I think there's a lot more to it. So well, Yeah, I mean, I, I, I definitely think it was. I mean, there's a lot of mainstream pop acts from the 80s that, I could think of off the top of my head and say those were awesome outfits and you know you look at their music videos and yeah again I would wear that in a heartbeat and maybe even do wear that on on occasion I mean I'm trying to think of uh, Jody Watley I mean look at the video for uh, looking for a new love every outfit she has on in that video with the right hair and the right makeup that's a goth outfit it's an 80s goth outfit, but it's a goth outfit nonetheless. Bustiers, right. crinoline skirts, corsets. Right. And everybody had big big old fried hair in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's still... I mean, I had a crimping iron as a kid. Because yeah. it was what was trendy. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's move to but 90s. But yeah, it is, a little, it is a little bit of a chicken and an egg kind of thing. Who was stealing from who? Right. And I think you could say that up until now for fashion. I mean, if you look at Couture Runway, are we stealing from that? Are they stealing from us? But yeah, Which but I mean, that's the going? thing. Like, it's because it's not, it's not just the trend of the time. Because, like I said, in the '80s, you still have 
appropriation of Victorian fashion. You have appropriation of like right. teddy and boys in the 70s, and mods and that kind of stuff. In the seventies, you had a lot of revival of Victorian fashion, which right. I think might have been a little bit influenced by Dark Shadows, maybe. But a lot of that stuff, even when I started getting into the scene and started thrifting, was still in the thrift shops. So I wore a ton of wacky seventies right. Victorian blouses. Right. Which yeah, looking and, I back, mean, some were good, some not so good, but that's I mean that's part of it though because now it, when I go to the thrift store now if I am trying to find a jacket that has shoulder pads in it or is made of velvet or something it's almost impossible. Right. Just because, you know, it's secondhand stuff. But that's that kind of thing is still being made in the kind of goth market. Uh all right, so okay, so let's move. On. I actually don't remember this article at all, so I don't know what her argument is. Maybe it's at the conclusion here, but let's go to '90s. Uh, she says, "Of course, not every trend that was popular in the '80s died as soon as the '90s rolled around, and not a lot of goths were still wearing looks that were common in the '80s. But much of goth fashion was becoming less punk and more romantic during the mid to late '90s. The '90s brought with it a strange obsession with the occult." Shows like Charmed, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and movies like The Craft began influencing certain fashion trends. Velvet dresses with combat boots became staples in both goth and mainstream fashion. Uh, Okay. 90s hair became less styled and more free, and many goth women began adopting the free-flowing look that added to the mysterious, seductress vibe. Makeup became less geometric. It was popular at the time for women to go uh, linerless or wear dark up more darker, more natural tones in a smudged fashion around the eyes. Young goths were ditching the pointy shoes to go with the more popular platform style that the 90s was known for. Uh, yeah, I think for the 90s, she does actually make a decent argument here. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to agree. I mean, as somebody who sort of came of age, so to speak, in the 90s, that was absolutely true. I mean, yeah. a velvet dress and Docs was pretty much what I wore, or Winkle Fingers. I mean, I didn't abandon pointy shoes. I, I still <laughs> thought they were. But I always really loved the 80s. So even though I loved all of the stuff that was going on in the 90s, the romantic fashion and the velvet dresses mm-hmm. and the thrifting, I still had that sort of thing like, well, this is our source material, though. So this is to be respected. The mm-hmm. pointy shoes, the big hair, the cat-winged eyeliner. Mm-hmm. This is still something we have to keep. Like, we have to keep this alive. Because, to me, that's where it started. And that's the most authentic form of it. So even though I absolutely loved it and wore my fair share of flowy medieval dresses, I I always liked the... uh. I always liked incorporating a little bit of the eighties into it. Yeah. I, I, uh, I don't think it's necessarily as cut and dry as it seems on the surface just because of the, at, so like at the time you had kind of the second wave of goth music coming right. in and they were generally asserting that the, the stuff from the eighties was kind of of its time and it was kind of a, amalgam of all the stuff that was going on but it wasn't quite goth enough so there was that kind of shift to into the and people have made the argument that it the goth didn't really modern goth didn't even start to the 90s because there was such a dramatic shift from the 80s to the 90s because the new generation of people that were taking cues from the 80s wanted to make it their own and wanted to make it darker and wanted to kind of do that revivalist appropriation of of past this, this is from the the discussion we're having later in the show uh, well we were taking we were taking from it and adding to it which i think is right. the only appropriate way to do it you don't erase what happened right yeah you just add to it so to me you keep your crimped hair and you wear a long velvet gown or you wear the Doc Martens, but you wear velvet. Or, See, or, and-, or, and I think, too, in the 90s, and I know that I know that Angela Benedict has a video about this. 
we just weren't so hung up on like you're a death rocker or you're a trad yeah. goth or you're I mean that just bullshit just happened at the end of the 90s I don't know why it happened I mean I think it started kind of as a joke as like on all goth I fashion. think it started as a joke yeah well but, didn't, I mean, didn't it the was term not... goth didn't didn't the term goth actually start just getting used in the 90s like didn't it seemed like it was so nebulous in the 80s but I mean, I yeah, I wasn't. A, I came into it in the '90s, so it was. It Were was people referring goth. to themselves as just yeah? Goth? I mean, I was. Yeah. I don't know about anybody else, but yeah, that's the thing. Like, that's why I hate that whole thing. Like, to me, I'm just a goth. Yeah, I'm not an ethereal goth or a medieval goth or a romantic goth just because I wear bell sleeves one day and a leather mini skirt the next day. It doesn't mean anything. It's just what I feel like wearing, and it's all goth. And this is the problem with those kind of fashion taxonomies. Like, uh, 40 Years of Goth is not the first to do it, but like 40 Years of Goth, because it implies that the 90s was its own style, when in reality, there was new stuff happening, but everything else was also happening. Just like in the 80s, right. you had all kinds of different things happening. And as we move forward in time, there's, I think, at least for some circles, more and more of an emphasis on the differences between styles when there really is just all kinds of stuff going on. And right, I think and to that's, me, like, that's so, it's boring. Why are you limiting yourself? I mean, okay, if if you don't like wearing long skirts, fine. You don't have to say this is the type of goth I am, right. and I am yeah. not allowing myself to wear that. Like, I don't know. It's just, it just seemed a lot more free and a lot more fun. You know, if you were going to, see, I mean, for me, like if I was going to see Requiem in White, I wore my best medieval kind of my best dress. You know, something that had big dramatic sleeves and was like a jewel tone velvet. But if I was just going record shopping, a mini skirt, fishnets and boots and a band t-shirt was fine. You didn't have to, I don't know. You didn't have to say, well, I'm a death rocker. So I have to wear 16 pairs of fishnets so that I can't go to the bathroom. And you know, <laughs> that is a problem. It, it's it is a problem. It's it's a problem we all know. I don't know. It it just seemed it seemed more free and it seemed more fun. You know, getting up right. in the morning to get dressed was seems a lot more fun if you can say I'm going to wear what I want. Right. Uh, okay. So, two thousands style. Uh, she says, I think most of us can agree that the 2000s had some really hit or miss trends in both, go in both goth and mainstream fashion. And I can comfortably say that the 2000s is seen as a rather embarrassing decade by many goths now. <laughs> <laughs> I love these pictures. <laughs> yeah. This was the. Oh, wait, there are pictures? Oh, my God. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, go ask mommy. She'll get you one. You're welcome. Close the door, please. That's okay. Thank you. Love you. All right. Uh, where was I? Okay. This was the time that a lot of misinformed young people were flocking to Manson concerts and Hot Topic and were eating up everything that they thought was goth, whether it was or not. Many of the so-called goths you saw on TV in the 2000s were what we today consider mall goths. Mainstream fashion was really all over the place in the 2000s, and I think goth fashion was too. Pop stars were experimenting with strange color and style combinations, and goths started experimenting with neon. Rave fashion had evolved and trickled over from the 90s to the 2000s and into goth as well in what is called cyber goth. In the 2000s, baggy pants became popular with young people, and goths began sporting trip pants and other forms of cargo pants, Skater fashion clashed with the mainstream as well as with goth, and you would often see goth teens wearing Avril's signature eye look paired with a fishnet top and black baggy pants. I actually don't agree with that. I'll get to that later. Strip stockings became, sorry, striped stockings became popular, and high fashion was borrowing from goth more than ever. 
Thankfully, romantic goth survived well enough that not every goth looked like a cross between a Spice Girl, a Raver, and a character from Invader Zim. But unfortunately, there were a lot of misguided <laughs> youths experimenting with a subculture that they didn't know enough about. And with how many strange trends we blew through in the 2000s, it's understandable why goth fashion was so all over the place. Okay, so there's a lot there. Take a deep breath. <laughs> I don't know why Avril Lavigne is on yeah. these pictures. <laughs> I, I distinctly remember Avril Lavigne uh, coming. She was, I mean, she was skater, right? But she she was in Hot Topic, but she was coming off of the wings of the Malgoth kind of trend. She, I don't think Malgoths were borrowing from her. I, I think she came after the trend started, and that was just kind of playing into that audience. So I think in that instance, it was a case of, hey, this is what the quote kind of underground but yet visible to the mainstream youths are doing. So this is what we're going to market to. Yeah, I like I remember Avril Lavigne. I I didn't think it, you know, obviously even then when I was just a baby bat and really knew nothing, I'd never considered her remotely anywhere clothed close to goth um yeah. to me she was just somebody who was taking advantage of the increasing anti britney attitude that was kind of cropping yeah, up yeah i pe- people who were tired of, of vapid pop stars so she kind of used that to market herself as being a different vapid pop yeah. star with eyeliner right right <laughs> Yeah, I, that was the sentiment, definitely. I don't know how old Sandra Von Ruin is, but I do specifically remember that goths, like mall goths at the time, because I was hanging out with those people, um, did they hated her because they just saw her as trying to take advantage of what what was going on and but just marketing it to a pop kind of sensibility. So I don't, I don't, I think that's backwards there. Um, as far as cyber goth. Uh, sure. It evolved from rave fashion and found a place in some goth clubs and it has kind of stuck around, but again, it's, I think it's distinct enough in its history and its music and its fashion that you can safely say it's drawn on goth for its inspiration, but it's not, uh, part of goth fashion i don't think i know i know it was in 40 years of goth so it must be goth uh, <laughs> yeah so was emo yeah god don't, okay don't get i'm me surprised started. they didn't mention that uh in this if they're gonna mention avril lavigne they might as well mention emo and if we're talking about things that were mistakenly yeah. labeled as goth that's why i was so confused not not just I talked about it in in the video I put on YouTube about the actual history of emo where that came from. I'm not going to repeat that, but that is part of why I was so confused because if you grew up, if you were around during that time, there were so many there was so many videos and blog posts and contentions about stop saying emo and goth are the same thing when it was popular. Like there was no crossover there. Uh, okay, so let's let's jump into 2010's style. Uh, she says, and suddenly we are struck in this strange place between the 80s and 90s. Mainstream fashion in the past seven years has really borrowed a lot from the past, especially in the 90s. Uh, but this time it's doing it in a simpler, more flattering fashion. The 90s was cool, right? Well, if you're a 90s kid like me, then you probably jumped right on the 90s revival train like the rest of us, and you're riding it all the way through Nostalgia Town. Grungy ripped jeans, oh god, flannel and band (laughs) t-shirts, chunky boots and tattoo chokers are all back in style, and many goths are eating it up as well. I don't remember this happening in 2010s. Uh... But I'm going to, I guess that's now, right? We're still in the 2010s? Yeah, uh, but I'm going to, in the 2010s. <laughs> I'm going to give New Goth some credit here. Some of it is really nice. Black leather jackets, velvet, occult symbols, and fishnets. It's almost like it's paying homage, paying homage to 80s and 90s goth fashion. Of course, a lot of New Goth style is uh, in 2010 was really ugly garbage. 
but the style has improved over the years, encompassing other styles such as Strega fashion and Ninja Goth. Ninja I'm going to shoot goth. myself in the face. Witchy symbols ninja- are... What's Ninja Goth? <laughs> I don't know. Wait, is this something I don't know about? I don't. I actually don't know. I am Can gonna... I say that somebody on Tumblr gave me some sort of like shitty comment about... Like, I think tagging something or calling something Strega because it was cultural appropriation. Oh, my. I'm like, give me a fucking. I'm name. Italian, you moron. <laughs> I can't appropriate my own damn culture. Sorry. Side <laughs> tangent. Oh, my God. Uh, witchy symbols are being worn by goths and mainstreamers alike. Long band t shirts over leggings and wide brimmed hats are everywhere. Shows like American Horror Story. Okay, American Horror Story is the only reference for this style. People always say shows like American Horror Story. There's that one season where they had where people uh, kind of point to, but I don't see right, any coven. other shows. Yes, exactly. I don't see any other any other shows doing that. Uh, helped kickstart the witchy fashion trend, and everyone is buying it. I personally enjoy a lot of aspects of modern goth fashion because they remind me of the 80s and 90s. Even pointy shoes are coming back into style. It's possible that with the help of new goth and mainstream fashion, we may actually be able to kickstart a new generation of traditional goths and finally come full circle. (laughs) Okay. I mean, again, it's... The problem with new goth isn't that it looks kind of like goth. You know, it's the contentions I said before. And if you, if someone's goth and they dress in a new goth, what could be labeled as a new goth style, I mean, sure, whatever. Like, if you want to appropriate, she says she appropriates some of the new goth stuff into her look, that's fine. This isn't like what she was talking about before where, like, she wants to make allusions to mall goths or cyber goths where there's you have something new forming, drawing from... Uh, modern culture, which even though I think she's wrong there, this is different because it's drawing from past goth uh, uh, fashions and then it's separate and it's just using the word goth, like I said before, it's using the word goth in my opinion to give the fashion some legitimacy because goth is implicitly substantive and there is a historical and meaningful cultural uh, uh, movement behind it. But new goth itself is just vapid. It's just this thing that's appropriating goth to give it some legitimacy. That's what the problem is. Yeah, but I mean, hey, I... in two more years, there's going to be tons of black shit in thrift stores. Yeah, <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, I true. I saw it happen after the '90s when everything went to like the cyber type of thing or thing. The thrift stores were awash. With <laughs> velvet, long velvet skirts and ruffly blouses, and hey, if you could get a shrine ruffle blouse for six yeah. bucks, yeah, yeah, score yeah. on you. I mean, that's that's one of the great things about keeping with a subculture for twenty plus years is if you're a hoarder as well, which I am, <laughs> you just keep keep wearing all the old stuff, <laughs> and you still look good. And it, yeah, I was surprised. I was I saw on my Facebook memories yesterday. I was wearing a much cleaner, newer looking Susie and the Banshee shirt uh, that was from ten years ago. And I was like, "Hey, I still have that. I just cut the sleeves off." Uh, so. I still have a shirt that I bought in two thousand two that I think I wore last week. Nice. Yeah. I I literally I still have stuff from high school. Uh, but like, no, you're you're just following mainstream fashion trends, actually. Yeah, so. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, last paragraph here. Conclusion, I'm assuming. She says, so goth has never really been original. Uh, I Like I, we say later, like I argue later, it's, it's a revivalist movement. So maybe it, I, I kind of agree there. Uh, and just like every other fashion, it's going to keep evolving over time. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now that leather jackets and pointy buckle boots are coming back into style and more people are asking who Joy Division is after seeing one of their shirts hanging up in Forever 21, uh, we are now cl- now closer to our goth roots than we have been in two decades. Goth fashion was always about experimenting and expressing yourself, but even the best of us have fallen prey to trends, and that's not a bad thing. Fashion is something to have fun with, 
And if goth really does claim to be a subculture that's all about the music, then it shouldn't matter how a goth dresses. Wasn't all about the music the old Hot Topic tagline? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it yes. was, right? It was. You're right, and, yeah. and And I have to say, I don't think that there are a lot of people, maybe there are one or two, but I don't think a lot of people are going, hmm, let me research this thing that I saw in Forever 21. Yeah, no, I agree. I just, you, there's that's, that. And that's that's my thing with, with this type of, of fashion is that you can look at somebody and, man, I, we were, my boyfriend and I were talking about this a few days ago. And he was saying, he's like, if I were a single guy right now, he's like, I would be so confused. He's like, because I would go out and I would look at this woman, you know, I'd see these girls and I'd be like, oh, okay, she's my type of person. And you would go up to her and try to start a conversation and she would listen to Taylor Swift. But she would look like, a you know, a witch. Right. It's like, yeah. It's, you know. Yeah. It's very misleading. Yeah. I. Yeah. I think those people were around in the 90s, too. Uh... Yeah. I don't think it was quite so dramatic. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because I think now with social media, and not not to sound like an old person who blames everything on social mm, media, too late. I know, <laughs> but I think with social media, the way to gain likes and followers and recognition is to push your look to the nth degree. Where yeah. I don't think you had that in the nineties. I think people flirted with different looks in the 90s certainly i mean like i said in the 90s you could go into a mall and go into contempo casuals and buy you know some good crushed velvet dresses or and i think that there absolutely were non-goths buying them but they didn't make it like a quote-unquote lifestyle because you didn't have to instagram your outfit of the day right right you know, I think now, like, you, you have to put a picture of your outfit online, otherwise you didn't wear it. And if you have that pressure yeah, every day to keep this image up, then yeah. you're, you're, going to, you're going to be more extreme in your look. Yeah. Eh. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with going extreme. You just got to do it right. Right. No, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that if you're the type of person who... Yeah, you know, that's the that's the argument. your hair every day. That you know, I'm not. Yeah, absolutely. Please do that. But I, I'm saying that there are people who are just in it for the trend, but they're doing it full time. I mean, I live in a very kind of trendy area, and I see a lot of tattoos that I could tell you in a few years people are going to regret. It's like, yeah, you're you're not going to be all like weird and esoteric probably when this whole thing (laughs) passes just like a lot of people who got tribal armbands in the 80s or trying (laughs) to i mean in the 90s or or trying to cover those things up and it's not just you know subcultures either i mean it's you know uh kind of the instagram model fit like fitness model kind of thing it's Mm -hmm. all different all different there's there's those kind of people in all all different fashion trends and but that's the thing is that we keep reducing goth to how you look and it's certainly important i mean obviously the fashion and music kind of grew and the ambiance really the the atmosphere grew together uh but that's not all of all that it is and i think the reductionism and the the excessive labeling for that kind of thing is is a problem yeah, I mean it's I think it's where we're where we're getting into trouble. All right. So of course I'd like to quickly thank those of you who keep the show going, those of you who have decided that you would like to contribute to meaningful content about the goth subculture and about and those of us who have found a home and a place to belong and a family within the goth subculture and to support the community around that. And that, of course, would be uh, the wonderful people who donate on Patreon and help keep the show going, help keep our bills paid, and help the show to improve. So first of all, I'd like to start off at the founder's level, and that is the lovely 
Esmeralda, and Abigail. Thank you two so much for your continued support. At the Nocturnal Council level, we have Ariel, Trey, Samantha, Devin, and Anthony, all longtime supporters. And at the Noc- uh, Crow's Call level, we have Robin, Willow, Dom, Michelle, Elizabeth, Marco, David, Shelly, Rick, Elizabeth, Salem, Jen, and Lyrilith. Thank you all so much for your support. If you would like to get your name right on the show or get some of the bonus content that gets posted to the page, or you just think that Cemetery Confessions is something worth keeping around and something that should be around or just something that uh, gives you a little bit of entertainment, you can jump on the Patreon page for as little as $1 a month to get some cool rewards and help support the show. You can do that at patreon.com slash cemetery confessions. Album review. All right, so this month we are reviewing the newest album from Drab Majesty. Let me say that again. From Drab Majesty. The album is called The Demonstration. And we're actually going to start off by playing a track from the album. I'm going to play the second track, which is uh, more of a dancey, uh, poppy kind of song. And it's called Dot in the Sky. Oh, 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 
Usually I, I have you start off, so why don't you kind of give us... Always make me go first. You, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, yours, yours is so much more detailed than mine. I get to kind of riff off of what you're saying. So. Well, that's the thing. Mine's not that detailed this okay. time. But I'll, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll do my best. All right. Well, go ahead, and, go ahead and tell us what you thought about the album. Um, well, first off, just a bit about Drab Majesty. Like, I think they're they're kind of like a band... I think they're similar to like she passed away in the sense that they kind of they kind of popped up out of nowhere and instantly became like really big in the you know whole post punk yeah like I hadn't heard of them at all and then somehow I got my hands on the the first album and it was just I constantly played it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, because there's so many good post punk revival bands coming out. I don't know what it is that, uh, what the kind of magic combination is that certain bands just get traction and get get really popular. But yeah, I, th- I think. But, you're but right. I, I think it's great though. I think yeah. it's it's well deserved, yeah. uh, and this album I think is no exception. Um, okay, I'll just go track by track, uh, like I always do. Uh, <laughs> Track one, Induction, I have just a swirling synth intro, not really much to say yeah. about it. Uh, track two, Dot in the Sky, which we just heard. Uh, I have that it's very similar to the Frozen Autumn, except more guitar-driven. Mm-hmm. Like it almost, To me, it almost sounds like a Frozen Autumn outtake, and probably because of that, unsurprisingly, it's my favorite track on the album. Uh, yeah, it's probably my favorite. You know me, also. yeah. yeah. Uh, 39 by design has more of a dark and sinister tone, uh, kind of a shift from the upbeat, danceable aspects of the previous track. Yeah. Uh, number four, not just a name. This one kind of reminds me of the Cocteau Twins with like the guitars and just the, the snares with the delays on them, uh, kind of keeps the slow pace from the previous track, but sounds less sinister and just more dreamlike. And, uh, I guess, let's see, track five, Hath No Form. Uh, this is just kind of a detuned synth wash, not really much to it. Uh, I thought it went a little longer than it should have. Like, I would have, if I were them, I would have kept this track, like, under a minute. But this one went almost three minutes long. 
Uh, track six, too soon to tell. Was this th- was this their single? I, I don't know. I didn't. I don't. I didn't hear the single, so I don't know. Yeah, I think this was their single. Kind of sounded similar to something off their first album. Mm-hmm. Uh, have that it has a nice melody and catchy chorus. Uh, number seven, cold so cold souls. All I have written for this one is the birthday massacre and then question mark because <laughs> it fucking sounds like it's like the birthday massacre with male vocals basically. Uh, track eight, a spire points at the heavens. I have that this is just an ambient noise track. Uh, number nine, kissing the ground. Uh, the per- I thought the percussion was kind of more in your face in this one. Like, I could see a band like Cold Cave maybe doing a remix of this one. Uh, I, ha- I have to say, Mark, I just I just started listening to uh, Cold Souls again, and you're absolutely right. That yeah. synth sound totally sounds like... I didn't catch that, but that totally sounds like a Birthday Massacre song. Yeah, it's, it's like dead on, yeah. like, Birthday yeah. Massacre introduction. Um, let's see, number 10, Forget Tomorrow. This... This one kind of reminds me of like maybe some 90s goths, goth bands. I really loved the percussion on this one. Uh, I have that it's slowed down, but earnest and unsettling. Mm. And yeah. track 11, Behind the Wall, I just had that this one was a pretty straightforward post-punk track to close out the album. Uh, yeah. And then there, there were some remixes, but I didn't really write anything about them. I there were maybe four remixes. Yeah. Two of them were good. The other two were just kind of meh. Yeah, I I like the Cold Cave remix uh, yeah. personally, and it was more of a dancey one. And I'm not opposed to Like the other three were more experimental, kind of atmospheric. I'm not opposed to that kind of thing, but uh, they they just didn't really catch my attention. So, yeah. Eh. So my rating for this... Um, have four and a quarter out of five and it probably would have been four and a half if they would have just uh maybe cut down that hath no form a little shorter and, like eased up on the ambient noise tracks i'm only laughing because i love that if anyone's been listening to the show for a long time when when you first started being a the the other host on the show I sp- explicitly stated that we only go in halves <laughs> and holes <laughs> and every single time you've always, you've just completely ignored that and just gone with a, with quarters anyway. And I don't, I don't even yes. care anymore. I just <laughs> think it's hilarious. Uh, Next time I'm going to go with cookies. <laughs> like this one gets three Oreos. 4.29. Four, 3.14. Um, Michelle, do you have any thoughts about this? Oh, I absolutely love this record. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been a fan of Dread Majesty since, I think they came out in 20, no, wait, let me check. Yes, 2012, they came out with a four-track cassette uh, called oh, I miss Uranian that. Dances. It's really good. I, I, I can uh, mm. send it to you. Okay. But it, when I heard that, I was kind of like, okay, this is a band that if they get some production behind them are going to be just amazing like you you could already hear it like back then and their last lp was on my 20 was 2015 um top albums of the year and i just think that this is an further going of of that record it i absolutely love it i think it it's synth, but it's synth with emotion. You know what I mean? Like it's not necessarily cold synth. It doesn't sound like Marshall Cantrell or or Zeno and Oaklander. It's it's warm, almost like Depeche Mode. And I think mm-hmm. that in terms of the lyrics, it's a little bit like Martin Gore, where there's a vulnerability to the lyrics, and it's as we'll talk about later. It, a lot of the songs are capital R romantic. And if you really look at the lyrics, they have some really, really great lyrics. Um, I like the instrumentals. 
Um, I thought that they were the way the instrumentals were kind of unsettling was a great contrast to how dreamlike the songs with lyrics are. And it kind of reminded me maybe a little bit of the kind of ambient tracks that David Bowie was doing on Low that were a little bit off kilter. Um, I don't think that they interrupted the flow of the record as maybe they could have, but I think they actually added to it. Um, my favorite track was Kissing the Kissing the Ground. I mean, to me, that's just, that's a dance floor track. I mean, if you heard that in a club, I don't know how you wouldn't get up and dance to yeah. that. And I actually really liked the remixes too. Um, the Cold Cave remix was actually probably my least favorite. Not that I didn't uh-huh. like it. I just thought, I just thought that it made it sound like a Cold Cave song. Not that there's anything wrong with that because I actually right. really love Cold Cave, but yeah. it just really made it sound kind of just like something Wes Eyes Gold would do. Um, I really like the Marshall Cantorell 39 by Design remix because I think it just added such a spookiness to an already kind of spooky song. I mean, the subject matter of the song. So yeah, I I absolutely loved it. Um, I saw them when they were around with Cold Cave and uh, they were great. They had some sound problems because the day before they had dropped their synth down a flight of stairs (laughs) which as you can imagine is not really good for uh 80s analog synths yeah but uh yeah they were still great um deb demure on stage is kind of very it's a sight to see Mm -hmm. which i like you know i don't i think there's i think there's something missing nowadays a lot of people just go on stage and jeans and a t-shirt not that there's anything wrong with that if you back it up with good music but i like to see a show i I, yeah and you know i could only imagine that if the band gets bigger which i believe they totally deserve to if he had an opportunity and a budget to put on a bigger stage show i mean for me i don't know where else they played in the states but here they were kind of playing in the back room of a metal bar like a really tiny venue right. yeah. but i think if he had the budget and the opportunity to do something visual i think it would be really amazing do you have a so uh, i'm going out of five to, yep i am going to give it four and a third <laughs> okay <laughs> no i'm kidding i'm, I'm four going and to give a third it a, cookies <laughs> i'm going to give it a four and a half okay Okay, so I, I mean, I, I don't have too much to add to that. Uh, for me, the the album as a whole was really '90s heavy. There was a lot of influences from the '90s, uh, just various influences like Mark you mentioned, the Cocteau Twins. I thought, um, uh, what was it? Uh, not just a name. Thirty Nine by Design uh, had that kind of a, a ethereal dream pop influence. Uh, I also thought tracks like too soon to tell, um, also had a heavy nineties influence. Um, just, it was a different kind of influence The the synth, I think the synth throughout really was nostalgic for the nineties. Um, and I think even the interstitial songs that we didn't talk about too much, like, uh, what was the main one that stuck out to me was, um, hath no form that one two two and a half minutes it reminded me a lot of i don't know if it was a music video or a live performance i saw of drab majesty but kind of the the late night psychedelic 90s tv show uh kind of kind of the the uncanny uh weird sound uh, uh it was really 90s psychedelic sounding to me uh, which I like that. I, 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 overall, I thought it was, uh, you know, a lot of the post-punk revival stuff going on right now is, is really eighties heavy or death rock heavy or cold wave heavy. And it's nice to have more of a nineties influence, uh, kind of a dream pop ethereal 
sound with some more dancier tracks. So I, yeah, overall I thought it was great. I thought it was a, a big improvement on the first album, which was the only other Drab Majesty album I'd heard. I didn't know about that uh, that cassette or any other releases they may have. Uh, but yeah, so for me, I, I'm also going to give it a, a four and a half. I've been I've listened to it about five times now, and and I'm still really enjoying it. It's it's really uh, I like the variety because it different songs fit different moods. If I want to dance, he's got tracks for me to dance to. If I want to uh, sulk in a cemetery or uh, pontificate on existential philosophical topics. Uh, there's, there's more ethereal tracks for that. So it was really, uh, uh, one of those albums where there's a variety, but it's still coherent and that's really important for me. So yeah, four and a half out of five stars. You don't wake up one day and decide that you are God. It's a mindset. It comes naturally. It's a lifestyle. Just so you know, goth is about three things. Clothing, music, and lifestyle. I don't actually have a problem with the goth stereotype of the droopy music and the lots of eyeliner and all black. It's not about being depressed and it's not about being sad and locking yourself in a dark corner and just writing sad poetry until your fingers bleed. A lot of people think that goths are Satan worshippers or, you know, they sacrifice animals or they drink blood. The goth culture is finding beauty where other people wouldn't think to look. What is goth? It started out as an artistic movement about 400 years ago. Gothic art, gothic architecture, gothic literature. Where do you think we get the term gothic novels from? To me, what goth is is a movement uh, where people who like a certain type of music dress in a certain way to express that taste in music. And that's all it is. It's just an aesthetic thing. So what makes you goth is not to do with any kind of criteria. I don't know why people set out criteria. There's a very few things that I actually call goth. You see, that is the difference between old school goths and uh, many other people is that we are very cautious about what we call goth, actually. A lot of kids become goths because it just looks cool, you know, and that's fine too. But uh, at its core, it really is this um, this dismissing of the of the mainstream belief that we're happy all of the time and no one's ever sad, you know. Okay, so this month, uh, as you are aware, of course, we are going to be discussing gothic literature, much like the characters in gothic fiction who are often prone to sticking around or coming back after death, so too gothic literature refuses to remain buried and forgotten, much like the goth subculture. Generally agreed to have been conceptualized with the Castle of Otranto, uh, the first wave of gothic fiction, as it were, came about from the uh, generally 1760s to 1780s, and then the better-known second wave uh, was around at the end of the 19th century, which uh, produced many works that remain familiar even today, w including Dracula, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and the picture of Dorian Gray. Today, the Gothic continues to cycle through culture with new twists and new existential, existential terrors with films such as Crimson Peak, books such as Prince Lestat and the Realms of Atlantis, and uh, that also includes just general pop culture, music, art, clothing, and, of course, the goth subculture. As gothic literature is by no means my personal area of expertise, I'm very pleased this month to have two uh, specialists, as it were, on. Uh, and that would be Michelle returning, of course, from previous episodes and from the beginning of the show. I got confused there because we're doing this backwards. <laughs> and... Uh, Adrian, who is probably better known as Lygia Resurrected, uh, a very uh, pretty well-known YouTuber. I am a big fan of her channel. And she's actually also an author. Uh, the book is called Goth, The Guide for Baby Bats and Beyond. And she's also an incredible opera singer. Uh, you need to upload some more opera uh, singing <laughs> videos, no, Adrian. Is. But uh, thank you. Thanks, Adrian, so much for coming on. Uh, since we're having you on at the end of the show... Uh, if you don't mind giving us kind of a brief story of your history with goth, what kind of got you into it in the first place and, you know, your why you've stayed with it. Absolutely. So 
Um, I grew up in a very small town of the middle of uh, central Washington, which is hell. So <laughs> I am literally two and a half hours east of Seattle, and it's just absolutely painful. Yeah. Um, There's a pretty decent sized goth scene there, right? There is, yes. However, I have yet to experience it. I really oh, need no. to. Yeah. Um, so I kind of figured out that I was goth when I was about 10 years old. And up until that point, I had been submerged in, you know, Dark Shadows and the classic monster movies. Mm. And it was when I hit about 11 years old that I realized that there was a subculture that appreciated all those things that I grew up appreciating. Uh courtesy to my excellent and wonderful and badass and funny mother <laughs> who loves all that stuff and awesome. exposed me to that when I was a kid. Uh, you, I am so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> me too. My mother and I don't really talk anymore. Aw. Uh, but um, later on, I came to discover the music and definitely the literature. And I often got made fun of in school for reading the Gothic literature. You know, they make fun of the titles of the books that I was reading and saying that Edgar Allan Poe's mug on the cover of my book looked like Hitler. And what? Oh, yeah, no. I'm serious. I'm oh, serious. It was awful. And then um, one of the girls in my English class when I was in like seventh grade, I think, did a whole free write about how much she hates Edgar Allan Poe and what a dirty, nasty, no. you know, cad he was. And he belonged in a mental institution and whatever it's just she did it deliberately just to piss me off of course right. <laughs> wow and That's so I, i've stuck with it since when since then because it's just felt really familiar and comfortable and beautiful to me and it instills in me a sense of creativity and belonging but at the same time kind of re rebelling against how things are in the world and embracing a darker more beautiful way of life yeah yeah. Awesome. Okay, cool. Well, you, you kind of got into uh, how I wanted to start this discussion about Gothic literature. Okay. And that's just kind of for every everybody, you know, anyone can jump in on this. But I want to know where you guys uh, got your start in Gothic literature. And if it was, Adrian, you said for you, that was a big uh, push for you to get into the goth subculture. But um, mm -hmm. I'm interested to know where everybody, where their journey on the the Gothic literature is. Well, for me, it was my seventh grade English teacher. Uh, her name was Miss Martino. She was a kind of older Italian lady. She had a little bit of a mustache. Her slip was always showing. She had candles. <laughs> and she, to this day, I'm only saying that because I'm sure she's passed on at this point. That was a long time ago. Um, she, to this day, is my favorite teacher that I've ever had. Uh, she turned me on to mm. so many books. And... We read in class uh, The Telltale Heart and The Raven, probably around Halloween time. And when she saw how much I love them, she basically wouldn't stop giving me books for the two years that I had her as a teacher. <laughs> and it, I mean, they are to this day some of my favorite books. I mean, she gave me The House of the Seven Gables and Jane Eyre. She was even the one who told me about Anne Rice. She, you know, she told me, don't tell anybody I told you about <laughs> Anne Rice, because it was probably a little bit age inappropriate. But, <laughs> you know, and it was around that time when I also heard from another older person in my life, I also heard disintegration. So I like to think of everything that happened at that time period as like a perfect storm mm. of the universe colluding to make me go. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um. So I guess for me, I – let me turn this off here. My first introduction to Gothic literature was – so I, I guess in grade school we had the – I really kind of lived for um, the Halloween songs and the spooky stories and stuff, but I didn't have much of a conception outside of that because of the, the family I grew up in. So my first real exposure was, oh, probably when I was around 16 – uh, maybe 17 and I was trying to do some research online about what got the goth subculture was because I knew I was goth but I didn't really understand it and I was watching some videos from it was an interview uh, with patrons of a local club 
and they were talking about music. They were talking about the local scene, about uh, what got them into goth. And then someone came on and she was talking about how important it was. And I, th- I think she might have said you have to you have to read gothic literature to be goth to understand where goth came from and she started throwing out names like uh lord byron and mary shelley and uh these other in you know famous gothic writers that i had no idea what she was talking about but it sure sounded important so you know i knew who edgar Allan poe was and i loved poe but that was when i really started to um look into i started there i looked up those names and started reading some of the books and that's about where it ends because uh, that was my experience was for a few years reading some gothic literature and old and contemporary and that was about it and so that's why I have you guys on because I love gothic films and uh, I, I understand the concept behind it I've done some academic research on it but I don't have the experience of reading those texts unfortunately just due to I don't know. Well, right now it's due to time, but it wasn't a huge part of my uh, my worldview for the goth subculture, uh, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, so that's that's me. What about you, Mark? Uh, well, my experience pretty much uh, echoes yours. Uh, really, for me, my uh, experience with goth culture and just you know becoming immersed in the whole scene it was really driven by the music i think more than anything um so i really didn't have much exposure uh to the literature other than you know reading uh some of the poetry of uh, edgar Allan poe and i i read a lot of uh, emily dickinson i don't know if mm. if she falls into that era but um yeah my experience was really just uh brought on i think through music and after that came the the fashion and yeah. everything else but yeah I, I really wasn't immersed into the literature aspect of it yeah and i'm a bit remiss for myself to be honest um but i did want to a- get your opinions i know um adrian you made a video about this a while ago that got a lot of traction on youtube but this mm-hmm. this question about why gothic literature doesn't get talked about that much in goth culture and kind of um was it did, was were there phases where it was more popular or, or more common um i don't know if you guys have any th- theories or I, hypotheses about why it, it doesn't get talked about much i do but i don't know if anyone wants to chime in i do have a few ideas and okay. theories as to why it's not as talked about as much um i think it's due to two things one just culture worldwide culture as a whole has just become more and more shallow so it seems as though people are becoming more and more unwilling to dive into the literature and you know dive into self like introspection which i think a lot of gothic literature does offer and another thing too that i think contributes to it is it's there's been this whole thing with social media where it's all about the music and how you look that determines whether or not you're goth and i've noticed that within the last i don't know i'd say five maybe six years yeah i think yeah i think you kind of hit on part of what i was going to talk about or, Mm -hmm. or pontificate on was the the visual nature of how we get a lot of our information now you know everything social media is mostly visual especially when you get to places like youtube uh mm-hmm. so it does kind of uh, implicitly favor that uh, those mediums although i think you do a really good job with your book reviews and things like that to kind of push it um i i might differ slightly in the assertion of consumption being shallow at least within the goth subculture because i think that certainly could be the case, but uh, I do see I, I see more of a visual medium simply because it's easier to consume. But it is I do think it's possible to consume visual media that is gothic in nature, kind of carries on those themes from gothic literature, and is challenging. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think it. I think books do tend to make you think more about the material, but I think you can still get a lot out of it. Like for example, my. 
uh, one of my, well, probably my favorite contemporary film right now is uh, Only Lovers Left Alive. And there's a lot there. I mean, of course, there's a lot of allusions to Gothic literature. Of course, it's thick with that. But there's a lot to chew on in that film. Mm -hmm. You can kind of watch it and enjoy it as a romance film. But there's a lot, um, a lot to think about. So I don't, and I'm, you probably weren't even saying that, but. I don't think necessarily the act of reading is better because you could read 40 shades of gray or whatever. (laughs) Uh, But uh, I do think there is a loss of the, the more historical stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the goth subculture, even though it's a subculture, it still has influences from the primary culture. And Mm. we're really, I mean, we're riding a wave of really a backlash against intellectualism mm-hmm. i mean yeah. i definitely you think that. of if you think of the you know a certain person <laughs> shall remain nameless or- orange and then, a like, certain orange person yeah you know <laughs> kim kardashian and reality tv and yeah you know really reading books is almost becoming an act of rebellion like trying to mm. You know, and, you know, you have to say a lot of people are saying, like, we have horror going on around us. Why do we need to read Every books? day. You know, I mean, you could look at Twitter and it's pretty damn horrifying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there is also a lot of people say that maybe we're heading toward a new resurgence because, you know, secure societies don't create this kind of art. You know, I mean, if you look at what was created right. between... Yes. Yeah. The second, the end of the Second World War, and say Vietnam, there was not a lot of dark art coming out in that time because we were booming. Yeah, but now that no, we're not, maybe right. you know. Yeah, I'll just add on to that real quick. There have been uh, studies that show um, brilliance, genius, um, these sort of. Uh, monuments of science or literature or whatever these people that are that were uh, earth movers and prime movers come out of adversity so while you you know you want to move society to a place where everyone that you do you're doing the most good for the most amount of people uh there is a a psychological side to it where this the kind of comfort and complacency uh does breed uh like you were saying, anti-intellectualism and that kind of thing, and you don't want to wish for misery. No, you know, no, upon of course a population, not. But, of, of course but not. Like the, you right. know, after you know, on November 9th, people were saying like, <laughs> I don't care what kind of records are coming out. Like, we still need Planned right. Parenthood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, any any uh, anything else to throw in there? Yeah, I agree. I think that you know, it takes it takes adversity, and it it takes. Uh, troubling times to create something truly uh, monumental and uh, innovative and I think that's definitely been seen on the music front I mean I could talk about Joy Division Mm, just all the whole podcast but uh, (laughs) yeah I mean I I definitely agree and I, I think we are you know It's hard to say. You can't just say, well, we're in the midst of a resurgence because, you know, we really won't be able to tell until after it's happened. Until we're out of it, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, but I I think the conditions are ripe for a resurgence in just every aspect of the arts. Right. I mean, if you look at the boom of vampire-related fiction that came out in the late 80s to 90s when Mm -hmm. the AIDS crisis was really coming to the forefront of mainstream society not just gay and underground culture i mean the vampirism fear of blood fear of blood infection it's a parallel so i think a lot of dystopian novels are going to start coming out maybe not necessarily gothic novels but i think you're going to see a lot of people you know on the 1984 fahrenheit 451 kind of yeah those were best like trending bestsellers after Trump got elected, wasn't it? Or yeah, like I yeah. literally I walked past I walked past Strand bookstore today and that's what's in their front window. Those two books. Yeah. <laughs> and and the handmaiden's tale. The handmaid's tale. Wow. Like it's it's crazy. <laughs> and I think uh in the young adult 
community, I guess, like not counting like within goth, but that dystopian and post-apocalyptic theme is definitely gaining some traction within the last like five years or so with the Hunger right, Games. Right, like with the, the and Hunger Games. Divergent and all that fun stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I don't keep up with what I I don't know if there's too much substance there for the young adult stuff, but I do think it is I think it can be a legitimate outlet for kind of navigating those existential uh dread, I guess. It's an escape, but it's not world. too far away from real life. Right. Right. Well, going kind of along that line of thinking, uh what I wanted to do wanted to do here a little bit was to cover some of the uh, themes and uh, general other word for themes uh, <laughs> of gothic <laughs> literature um, and kind of see how we can talk about how they've impacted culture or impacted us or what if there's any parallel to uh, goth subculture because there's uh, what I'm going to get to is this idea that um, some people say and I've talked about this before um, but that goth culture comes out of gothic literature gothic architecture historically that there's a comparison there so i want to go through some of these themes where uh see where they came from and talk about how they relate to goth subculture now so since we're talking about culture we can start with um one of the main themes of gothic literature being romance over uh sorry romance and emotion over logic and reason or uh, romanticism versus the enlightenment uh, nature versus uh, industrialism that kind of thing um, I think there's somewhat of a connection I think that goths as a whole have a deeper and more complex sense of romance than your typical average Joe I suppose mm -hmm. um, lots of deep emotions and even if you take things into the bedroom I've noticed that kind of aspect there as well um, they tend to, and I kind of agree with this as well, just, they tend to reject the black and white, this is how it is, you better just freaking deal with it kind of thing, and we look into the more gray, uh, spectrum of how things are, um, and certainly right. within gothic literature, there are very high emotions, uh, yeah. Very little logic going on, but you do have some smart and snappy heroes and heroines every now and then. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there is a big, <clears throat> or at least stereotypically, excuse me, at least stereotypically, there's a, a big emphasis on uh, romance and on emotion. Uh, but I don't know. For me personally, I think there's an important balance. I think you have to balance it out with logic and reason. I, at least uh, for me personally, I you know just transitioning to being uh, non-theist at this point, um, logic and reason are are really important. But uh, you know, it, it is kind of that backlash against uh, the Enlightenment, where you have this focus on you know, you know romanticism was kind of this idea that uh, you can find transcendence real real uh touch the sublime through nature through um mm -hmm. uh meditating on on natural processes and that kind of thing rather than uh you know conducting scientific experiments or that kind of thing that was more popular with the enlightenment um so i yeah i think i think your gray analogy is is great because i do think there needs to be a balance uh but you know everyone whether or not this is lived out i think most goths have an affinity for the really stereotypical uh, gothic romance kind of, uh, you know, label. Mm -hmm. I think it kind of depends on the individual as well. I mean, I, I've I've met a lot of goths who, who come off as very, uh, you know, logical, very cold, hard logic. You know, you have a lot of programmers who are goths, yeah, and they're right. very logical and scientific. Yeah. So, you know, like you said, gray area is key. Uh, I mean, I consider myself kind of a a human Spock at times, mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, there's also a side that just shuns all logic and just, you know, goes out uh, just driven fully by emotions and, you know, yeah. I, th I think there is two sides. 
yeah, it's when it, I think, yeah, I think that's a good comparison. When you do get into the emotional realm, you know, you can have that, that aspect, which is important. And then when you get into the emotional realm where with mainstream culture, it's more about, uh, sucking and fucking as it were. And when you get to goths, it's much more about, <laughs> about, uh, you know, the, the atmosphere of it, the, the, the foreplay, the really, not to really say that embracing. there isn't sucking and fucking yeah. in goth culture. <laughs> you get to that. Yeah. yeah. No, but uh, I, th- well, I think our culture yeah. does tend to what what I call capital R romance, like romance in the mm-hmm. romanticism mm-hmm. sense that we're talking about, mm-hmm. where you're drawn to a person not only for their their outside, but their inside as well. Mm-hmm. People have aesthetic things Definitely. that they have in common, and I think that that really draws people together, and in a less... You know, goth people tend to be a little less gender conforming. We're not hung up so much on heteronormative behavior. I mean, to tell you what I did today, my partner, my straight partner and I sat and we watched YouTube videos of runway shows and he was Mm. so into it and blown away and critiquing the way the, you know, the way McQueen cut this jacket. He was... (laughs) And, you know, you're not going to find a lot of straight men who are willing to do that. But in the goth subculture, you will. Yeah. 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 You know, it speaks more to their creative side than it would with your typical average Joe. Sure. I mean, we have a lot more in the community. We have a lot more artists and, you know, and, and things that are maybe not your stereotypical male or stereotypical female pursuits. Yeah. And so, all right. Well, so the next thing going on that theme then is, is drama. Uh, Gothic literature is obviously very incredibly overly dramatic and there is definitely, you know, I'm interested to hear your takes on this. There's definitely the stereotype of, of Gothic drama, the hand (laughs) stapled to the forehead, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. I don't know how much that is actually played out in real life in comparison to other scenes. Uh, but I think there, I think for me, at least I think there's kind of a cherishing of drama, at least up to a certain point. Um, it com- I mean, you mean, it, it does you mean become drama added. like so-and-so said that you're not yeah, goth or you mean blown. drama I, like, I don't know. But I tend like, to be a you know, little performative I don't know. Kind of, <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> No, I think it's Listen, both. I'm I'm I, I'm Italian Irish. I can't <laughs> help it. It's I can sympathize with you there. I'm part Italian. Yeah, I mean, we are we are emotive people. <laughs> and I'm Sicilian, so see there you go. I'm, I'm cool like you guys. <laughs> see. Uh, <laughs> no, I've definitely run in circles, uh, circles of friends that are goths that are that are. Re- really embrace the drama stereotype and everything is a massive event every every little slight every little uh flourish of emotion or of dress or whatever everything is super over the top and that's exciting uh for a little while but it gets super tiring well yeah i mean though no, there's a there's a time and a place for for everything yes. yeah. when you're when you're on the dance floor that's that's yeah. the time for that but and I don't not, I don't like, think work. that I don't think that necessarily <laughs> comes from goth culture. I think people, you know, that might be just a part of their personality and maybe that's a factor in what draws them toward goth mm, culture, right. but More they're expensive. not they're not dramatic because they're gothic. Right. Yeah, it can be an individual thing and uh drawing upon the literature aspect, I think it really just depends on what you gravitate toward like you have the hunchback of notre dame there is so much drama going on Mm -hmm. lots of crying and saying how much you love someone and fire and lots of passion lots of confusion you know lots of sex even (laughs) and um that does happen a lot in gothic literature but that type of drama may not necessarily transcend to a different you know gothic novel However, right. goths as a whole, we do enjoy the, the theatricality, we enjoy the drama, but 
I guess it just depends, like we said, on whether or not you just have a personality that just gravitates toward being more dramatic than your average Joe. I keep, I keep using that a lot. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. Um, so... So let's jump back into, uh, we'll do one or two more of these. Um, so the, yeah, the other, I was talking about dark atmosphere. So I was, what I was saying was, um, like when it comes to the environment or often they're in houses or uh, labyrinths or that kind of thing, they often become their own character. Um, the, the, the environment, the atmosphere, the ambiance is often just as important to the story as uh, the actual characters are. Um, so I think that's another huge parallel because for me, and I, I, I think personally this is kind of missing from goth also, uh, at least where I am, is the the atmosphere. And I talked about on a previous show how important that is to me. And I think it's, uh, it's something that we should kind of get back to because I, I think that's really vital to kind of building a, a goth, um, I don't know, worldview or whatever you want to call it well just with the the you know dimly lit atmosphere and the smoke and uh, i know at the the club i go to they have a projector and they usually show a lot of old uh obscure maybe like italian horror from the 70s or you know just something of that nature uh, usually involving the supernatural or or something along those lines and it it I think that coupled with the music, you know, I can definitely sense just a feeling of otherworldliness and almost like a dream like state. Uh, no drugs required. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I wanted to, all right. I want to take a cultural perspective because that's kind of my thing um, and talk about more around the the lines of where historically goth culture draws on gothic literature and how what those parallels are uh and and you know well i've got a something i want to talk about i have a quote from katherine spooner as well uh, and we can kind of discuss that as we go along but my opinion at least uh, contrary to some other people that i know is that you can't actually draw a historical lineage from Gothic literature directly or, or like a deterministic line into the Goth subculture. Uh, but there are some broader connections like we've kind of been talking about. And, and the one that's really important to me is just kind of the base of where the culture comes from. And it's similar to the Gothic and that it's a reappropriation and reimagining of various anachronistic ephemera. Um, all that stuff is put together and kind of bastardized, much like a, a good parallel is Frankenstein's monster. You have all these various anachronistic ephemera, different different uh, people that you're drawing on and reappropriating and perverting into one monstrosity. <laughs> uh, so the term, um, the term, the the term Gothic rather itself actually harkens back to, of course, the Northern European tribal people of the Dark Ages. Uh, so that's another area where it's it's pointing to a revivalist movement. It's reappropriation for other purposes. Um, and, um, you know, there, it draws on the 17th century ecclesiastical architecture uh, with its wild shapes, um, that in itself kind of echoed the earlier overthrow of Roman civilization with the barbarism of the Goths. And I think that's kind of that historical revivalism is kind of a mirror image of the Goth subculture and that you do have all these uh, anachronistic, you know, not just drawing on the past, but you have all these differing stories about where, who used the word goth first, who used the <laughs> <Right>. word gothic <laughs> first, who called themselves the first goth band, you know, what was the, who was the first goth musician, that But kind most of stuff. important, who um, denied being goth first? Because <laughs> <laughs> right. that's the ultimate. Now, Catherine Spoon, she was the one who said there's no real original goth. It's all a, she was the one who said that, right? That it's mm -hmm. all a copy um, of something. Yeah, I kind of drew that from her. Um, I have a the, so the quote I have from her is she says uh, she says the Gothic is also, however, profoundly concerned with its own past, 
self-referentially dependent on traces of other stories, familiar images, and narrative structures, intertextual illusions. If this could be said to be true of a great many kinds of literature or film, then Gothic has a greater degree of self-consciousness about its nature, cannibalistically consuming the dead body of its own tradition. So yeah, it's, yeah. I, I, I think... And I, I mean, I totally agree with her on, on that point. And we're also, we're, we're concerned about a, a past that only we have imagined. <laughs> Right. And we can access right. that past through the literature. That's a good point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that, all right. So, well, so going on from there, kind of uh, to another area of discussion is um, this integration of the Gothic. And we kind of talked about this, but the integration of the Gothic into mainstream culture um, and mainstream culture appropriating those themes and telling those kinds of stories. Uh, I think there's kind of two sides of the argument here. Some people argue that it's watering down the core elements that revolve around death, decay, <clears throat> psychological instability, and so on. Um, and others argue that it's actually a sign of a culture that's wrestling with resistance to the elite um, like you were saying, Michelle, subversion of gender norms, um, disruption of the status quo, um, that kind of thing. So I, I don't know if you guys have what, what do you think about the mainstream ubiquity of, of the gothic kind of coming back? I'd say it's it's really all about making money. I mean, sadly, that's the bottom line when it comes to these sort of things. Um, I, I would agree that people, you know, certainly have. A fascination with these you know kinds of things but it's it's fascination from a distance almost you know the way people would go to a circus um, and I, I, I think mm -hmm. corporations are able to exploit that and you know create these these movies you know whatever um, you know I'm not saying it's a good thing or a bad thing it's just Bottom line, it, it is all about making money. So, okay. So it's not necessarily incumbent on the viewer to take meaning from it. it the material itself is actually just bereft of, of meaning. It's just for commercial purposes. Well, yeah, yeah just on paper. I, I think it is up to the viewer. Right. You know, that's an entirely you know, different side of things, how, how the viewer interprets it, but just, you know, looking, looking at it from just an objective viewpoint. Yeah. It's just, it, it's to make money. So the socialist has spoken. Does anyone have, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think like anything else know. you have to, you have to look deeper. I mean, where, we listen to goth music because we looked deeper than the top 40. And I think it's the same with any kind right. of art that you consume. You know, if you're going to go and look at what's in the front of Barnes and Noble, you might not find anything to your liking. Right. But if you go to an independent book stop shop or see an independent film, you know, I mean, only lovers left alive. I don't know where you were, but for me, it wasn't playing at the multiplex. It was playing at an art no, house theater. Yeah, no. Oh boy! You know, and you yeah. you have to seek that out. And I, you know, yeah, it was only for two nights in Chicago. Oh lord. Well, um, in my opinion, I think that it is a sign that the deeper content is starting to conquer the elite and um, shallow life and culture that just culture in general not just the goth subculture but just culture in general is steering toward i think that gothic themes and stuff like that being brought more into the mainstream i think is just countering that shallowness um you take shows like penny dreadful for instance these are very gruesome very mm, deep yeah. very complex stories and yeah. they have a huge following even though probably most of the people i know of who watch it probably aren't goth but they do have that tendency and same thing with crimson peak it's drawing upon a very um gothic complex love story and one thing that really got my goat was you know critics 
crapping on it because it wasn't scary enough. Is it scary enough? <laughs> I'm just like, dude, get over it. It's not, you know, it's a gothic romance. It's not meant to scare the crap out of you for no reason. It has a deeper, complex story, and the focus is going to be on the romance. But um, people who loved it obviously got its message, and I think that slowly, very slowly, we are starting to steer toward that. Yeah, I th- uh, you've, so you've got other examples like um, that Edgar Allan Poe movie that came out. Um, I'm trying to think of other films. I think most of the action is happening on TV. Like Game of Thrones is huge. Game That's of, got yeah, a lot Game of, of like, philosophical romance, mm-hmm. romanticism in it. Yeah. I mean, even like uh, um, others- The Vampire Diaries and the originals. Right. The originals, yeah. I like that. <laughs> and, you know, I, I tried to read those <laughs> books, like the original Vampire Diaries, when I was like the target demographic, like when I was like, 15 and i couldn't make it through because they were so terrible but yeah i really i i i, I, like I the watched, originals I watched clarify, the show like it was yeah I, I i watched both of them i don't know they were like candy okay. but i mean that's you know <laughs> right, if, you, right. if you think of it i mean if you think of it who are the heroes of those shows i mean klaus michelson yeah. he's a bastard yeah. but he's the anti-hero yeah. he's rochester he's heathcliff mm-hmm. They're jerks, yeah. but you're rooting for them. He's Archdeacon Frollo. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I mean, at the end of Jane Eyre, when she says, Dear reader, I married him, you're happy. You're happy that she married a man who tried to trick her into believing that he was going to marry somebody else, and then tried to get her to commit bigamy. And all of a sudden, you're like, no, he's great. I'm gonna so happy for them. <laughs> and you know, that's what happens on on these shows. I mean, even look at the rise of the popularity of the character of the Joker. I mean, that's it's an anti hero yeah, and all of the anti heroes yeah. come from gothic fiction. That popularized it. Yeah. I mean we I'm don't so we don't live in a black and white Joker. world. <laughs> I, I have do not we, we're not gonna talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay. We're not. Yeah, we're just gonna pretend that didn't happen. We're gonna leave it with Jack Nicholson and All Heath right. Ledger. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Jared Leto Sorry. will forever be Jordan Catalano to me, but <laughs> I'm old, so. <laughs> um. Well, so uh, I guess in keeping with time, we can kind of briefly touch on this. Uh, just the music perspective. A lot of the, because I have heard the argument before that goth in fact i think it's in the bumper for this segment um but that goth culture is only about music and aesthetic and there are no connections with gothic literature so kind of going in the other direction from what I was i've heard that about. but there are there are a lot of connections mm-hmm. right so the, yeah. the couple that i came up with were um dead can dance drawing on baudelaire mm-hmm. um Bauhaus, of course, drawing on German expressionist films and and Dracula, that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, Fields of the Nephilim, kind of in more of the um, esoteric realm of of Gothic literature, on the spiritualism kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, that's all I've I got, mean, though. I don't <laughs> just like Heaven is Annabelle Lee. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, and then yeah. you have uh, Super Aeternus. And the Ensemble of Shadows drawing yeah. on, you know, the themes in uh, La Fleur du Mal by Charles Baudelaire and mm, um, right. Edgar Allan Poe as well. Excuse me, I'm sucking down. Absinthe. It's okay, I am too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to briefly touch on that be- just to kind of dispel that argument, because even in the very early days with if you just want to start with Bauhaus there was a very large influence from gothic literature gothic film uh it, you know the, the bat cave it really drew on the the monster um the kind of universal monsters and and other stuff uh, so there was a big influence drawing from those kind of subversive uh not mainstream stories uh into what would become the goth culture so uh, there's a pretty big connection there um, okay, well, I wanted to go over, like we did with the comparisons, there's a, a few uh, themes of Gothic literature that don't, f- I, I think, may not fit with uh, the goth subculture, and we can kind of discuss those. Uh, we'll go over just a few of these. So the first one I had was a obsession with patriarchal power uh, that's usually unrestrained 
It's often sexual. Uh, if you want to think about Dracula, uh, people who haven't read the book are often surprised that Dracula is basically almost a rapist. Um, taking taking advantage of the males, often taking advantage of or abusing women um, through violence and that kind of thing. And I, I think that's very and maybe I'm wrong on that. I don't know. But I think it, that's very counter to the no, narrative. No, you're, you're totally of, right of about that. Um, you had Manfred in the Castle of Otranto chasing after the virginal Isabella. And that was, mm. you know, him hoping that he just wouldn't be destroyed because his only son was mysteriously murdered. And you also have that theme in The Monk in which the main character Ambrosio, you know, um, through his intense, you know, keeping himself away from the rest of the world, builds up this amazing sexual tension, and then he relieves some of it with his sorceress mistress, and then he relieves some of it by raping a- Antonia at the end of the novel. And again, that's that patriarchal, strong, mm-hmm. domineering influence. And again, it doesn't really fit in with the you know, less heteronormative uh, right. theme that we have going on with the Gothic subculture as it is now. Yeah, and I think, and the second part of that was just, I think this is, at least from my research, more indicative of the first wave of Gothic literature, but uh, on the other end of it, women being uh, the damsels in distress, the ones who are, uh, they're usually on the run from from the men, they're usually less intelligent, um, I know there's, you guys can probably think of examples that are counter to that. I think a contemporary example for where you have a more agentic, powerful woman uh, is is like we were talking about Crimson Peak because they kind of switch the classic male-female hair, uh, uh, characters where uh, the male is kind of the pawn. He's the one who gets pushed around by the women. Um, but I do think that is kind of a theme in early Gothic literature as well. I'm trying to think. I think there's some ex- some uh, counter examples of that where the women are the are the more agentic, like powerful characters. I would but. say that would be accurate in the case of maybe the Mysteries of Adolfo by Anne Radcliffe, and she tries to make her heroines more headstrong and willful and yeah. more intelligent. Yeah, they still do well faint a lot. Yes, they do. <laughs> they do faint a lot, which you know. But I mean that. You know, that's just very dramatic. And back then, everybody had a fainting couch available. So well, duh, of course, it was yes. sweeping the life out of them. What do you expect? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but I mean, I think if you look at if you look at Wuthering Heights, Kathy was every bit the monster that Heathcliff was. Mm-hmm. You know, just because she was the woman doesn't mean that she was really any less sinister. Um, to take a later example in Rebecca you know, the character of Mrs. Danvers, she was, she was really the villain of the novel. I mean, you think maybe it's, it's the husband, you think it's Maxime de Winter, but it turns out it's, it's really the housekeeper who's, you know, trying to get this poor woman to commit suicide, or she's basically gaslighting her throughout the whole novel. Right. I think, uh, I guess Carmilla might be another example. And I think, um, I just thought of this just now, duh, <laughs> was um, Lygia by Edgar Allan Poe. He's carrying on. Right. Well, of course, that's my YouTube channel's namesake. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, in the first few pages of the book, he is carrying on about how beautiful she is how intelligent she is and how he relies on her like faithfully and there's even a line in the book where he says um i have said that her learning is far beyond any that i have known in woman but where breathes the man who has traversed her vast you know uh vast realms of her knowledge so she's he's basically saying that she's smarter than any man that he's ever known and back then that's that's intense. That's intense to say something like that back then. And to mean it complimentary. <laughs> Very. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, to to say back then that you had a man's intellect was almost an insult. <laughs> <laughs> now maybe it's an insult again. I don't know. That's I can not... only hope. <laughs> we won't go there. I don't know. No. 
present company excluded, of course, gentlemen. Of course. Of course. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but I mean, no, even, you know, going, aid, going okay. back again to Jane Eyre, I mean, she was mm. very headstrong and she would not let herself be the damsel in distress. You know, she oh, was no. a very... That was Anne, Anne Radcliffe, right? Oh, no, uh, one of the Bronson no, no, no. sisters. Okay. But, you know, she would not let herself be... As much as she loved Rochester, she would not compromise her morals for him and, you know, ran away literally into the night penniless and didn't go back to him until mm, yeah. she had... I mean, I don't know. Do we do spoiler alerts on 200-year-old books? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't until no. she inherited a fortune no. of her own that she came back to him on equal footing. Mm. Or maybe yeah. even above him, because at that point he had lost his house. Right, and his yeah. sight. And his sight. Yeah. I do love that movie. I haven't read the book, but I love that movie. Though. Which version of the movie? <laughs> I'm going to be all snobby about it. Oh, I didn't Sorry. know there were multiple. I don't know. It's the whichever one my wife owns. I don't, I don't well, how long is it? Is it two hours or five hours? Oh, it's very long. Okay. Uh, I think it's the five yeah, hour Yeah, that's one. the good one. With, yeah. Ruth, with yeah. Ruth Wilson as Jane, that's the best one. In that's my right. humble opinion. I mean, the one with the girl whose name escapes me, but the girl who was in Only Lovers Left Alive. And oh, yes. Michael Fassbender. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, they yeah. condensed the story, but that... As far as cinematography, that movie is beautiful. Oh, definitely. But I just want to see uh, like every moment that's in the book. So I like the longer version. Mm, right, right. I like movies right. like that. Yeah, they do. There, there seems to be a a much higher uh, count quantity of uh, gothic literature adaptations that have a longer version. Uh, there's a few. I can't think of them. I've seen them, though. Yeah, like, because a lot of them are from like the BBC long. who broadcasts them like in parts mm, as almost okay. like a right. miniseries instead of a movie in the okay. theater where nobody's going to sit in a theater for five hours. I've seen a few. I have to ask my wife. It, it seemed like they were mo- films, though. I've seen a few of them. I can't remember the names of, of the films, but they seemed like like movies. Not, yeah, I mean, like they're, they're incredibly like parts, high but, budget and really yeah. well done. Um, all right, so another uh, another aspect that's common in Gothic literature is dualism. Uh, uh, of course, most salient with the book Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Um, but basically, uh, dualism is this idea that the real, um, the kind of corporeal life that we live is just as important and real as uh the supernatural or or metaphysical forces uh and that you the two uh, you need to have the two and there's there's this connection between the, the idea of the body and the soul are one kind of thing um and i know there's some some stories where at i think mostly and radcliffe uh but at the end where the what seemed to be supernatural is explained uh through natural processes uh but but yeah, that's a big theme, and I don't think it's indicative of goth culture because uh, you do have like a lot of atheists who are goths or um, you know various non-theistic occult religions kind of thing. Um, so then I had a quote. I think this was also from was it Catherine Spooner? I'm not. I don't remember. I didn't write it down, but. Uh, it says Gothic fiction was intimately related to the Enlightenment, since it is only a society that has stopped believing in ghosts that is able to turn them into a source of entertainment. So that's kind of on the other side of it. Um, but I think that is uh, an interesting quote, and I think kind of relevant to modern culture as well, uh, where we've kind of explained away the supernatural with technology. Uh, you've got like the I, I think the last number I heard was the amount of people in the U S that are uh, no longer religious or don't have any belief necessarily is like up to like 25%. So you have people leaving religion, that kind of thing. So really, um, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. It's been, it's been growing for the last three years, like three years ago, it was 16%, which was a, a huge st- statistic. Now it's up to about 25, 30%, 23%, depending on which poll you're going with. Um, it's hard to tell where I live. 
<laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so then the last one I had was... Excuse me, hang on. A bit gassy. Uh, <laughs> the last one I had was... <laughs> This idea of the sins of the father, uh, which is this theme where uh, it comes up in Gothic literature a lot. The past comes back uh, f- when you thought it was dealt with and it was gone. It comes back usually in a different form. You've got um, undead characters like ghosts or um, uh, other ethereal forms. And the main characters are often forced to discover what has happened in the past that's causing the anguish in the present. So there's that dynamic between the two. And usually the theme then is while trying to deal with the past, the character in the present often ends up perpetuating the violence or, or the vengeance that they're actually fearing and trying to, uh, to, to fix from the past. Um, and, it's an interesting dynamic for a story. I don't think it has any bearing on uh, gothic culture, even a goth culture, even if you want to talk about like a, a worldview or a mindset. I think there's a focus on the past, but not necessarily in a bad way or something that needs to be to be fixed. It's usually just like nostalgia, right? Well, what about all those bands that sound just like the sisters? Is that like not Sins <laughs> of the Father? <laughs> sorry. Uh, that was good. I'm sorry. That was good. Ba- Baha's aping David Bowie for like everything he was worth. No? Okay. Stre- okay a stretch? <laughs> you know I had to bring up Bowie. Come on. I'm not going to get into this Bowie argument again. <laughs> and Marilyn Manson while we're on the subject. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'll Lord. Tell you. Adrian, we had on one of our previous shows, we had a debate where someone argued why Manson was more important to Gotham. And it was not me, by the way, who argued that. People were like screaming at each other. Oh, Lordy. I'm glad I wasn't there for that one. That would have been horrifying. (laughs) It was all in good fun. Okay. (laughs) That's what's important. Mostly. Mostly. Well, that that play that plays in Penny Dreadful for sure. I mean, there's a lot of um, parallels yeah, to the char- yes, characters yeah. in Penny Dreadful. I mean, Ethan and um, even Sir Malcolm. You know how his sins affect his children, and you know, horrendously. Just, I mean, just for a like, that. yeah, just just for a modern a, a modern thing. And and uh, to go back to uh, the show, the originals. You know that's that's definitely yeah, a sins that, of the father, right. that's a really or all point. all yeah. vampirism. Yeah. Really, it's it's a bloodline. And yeah. if you look at you know, you look at it from yeah, that point on of what view. Mythos you're in. And then right. um, you have to go back and kill right. the progenitor. Yeah. yeah. And then going back on uh, Manfred and the Castle of Otranto, that was a, definitely another case of sins of the father. You know, his grandfather met a very gruesome fate, and there was a prophecy that somehow the um, the great house would collapse upon itself when the ruler became too powerful, and that's eventually what happened to Manfred. Poor bastard. Poor bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Never saw that coming, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, hey, chasing a little virginal girl around the, your enormous house is not going to help you any, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right. So before we go, um, I know I have, I, so I definitely have an affinity for Poe, mm-hmm. but I think our, our two guests, Adrian and Michelle eclipse me by a vast amount in their love for Poe. So I wanted to talk about Poe a little bit cause he's important and you guys love him. So what, I guess the first thing we can talk about is why we love Poe, why he's important to us. What I really love about Poe is that he really began to transcend the boundary between life and death. And he really put forth the question, you know, what really happens after we die? Is it really that final? Um, You know, is there something more? Is it possible for my beloved to come back? And as you know, a lot of his most famous and tortured works of fiction and poetry were inspired by the passing of his beloved wife, Virginia. And... um, a lot of his works do reflect that and his just undying 
passion and respect and love that he had for his wife and just women in general in his life that he adored. It wasn't sexual in any way. It was just, you know, devoted and sweet, but at the same time overladen with that sorrow. And like I said, like, Gia is my favorite story by him because it really pushes that boundary in that very real and tangible way. Um, I mean, everything Adrian said was, of course, spot on. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, I mean, just the way he wrote, his prose was perfect. There wasn't a superfluous word or passage. Everything had... It was so calibrated. It was so finely calibrated. And, you know, I think all the tales of this image of this drunken fall-down Poe, they're just such an insult to his talent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Do you guys have a favorite uh, story from Poe? Or, or poem? Or... Oh, God. Obviously, so you many. said Lygia mm-hmm. already, but Michelle, I know you... You know, I and it's one of the shorter ones. I absolutely love the Black Cat. And if you've never, if you've okay. never heard Diamanda Galas read the Black Cat, go do that no, like I right haven't. now. <laughs> I mean, Poe is terrifying. Right, be, you guys talk. I'll she right. is so terrifying. It's just it's such a perfect combination. Um, I I love his poetry too. You know, um, a dream, a city by the sea. They're just, mm-hmm. they're so beautiful. They are capital R romantic. I find that the sleeper really reflects that capital R romantic when it comes to admiring your lover as they sleep in their death, like in their mm-hmm. final resting place. It's just gorgeous. Yeah. I, I think my my first love and still my probably my favorite is the Mask of the Red Death, oh, and I know yes. it's it's popular and everybody knows about it, but but it's popular it's for really... a reason. It's popular because it's fantastic. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was you know I went to so uh, during the Halloween season the place where we got married. It's a it's a uh, it's a like almost two hundred year old uh, manor. Um, massive all different kinds of rooms they have plays all year they have a a, a theater company that works there but they do halloween oriented plays kind of spooky ones and two different years that we've been now they have done a play about poe but the way they do it is it's two parts you have scenes of poe's life uh him alone in in his in his room kind of pontificating coming up with his stories him interacting with his mother his you know all the different people in his life having those stories play out and you also have um it actually moves you get up and move to different rooms throughout the manor so um some they they reenact different plays as well so that's kind of inner interstitials within the story so they do like pit in the pendulum and uh, telltale heart and then they end with uh, mask of the red death and it's just incredible because it gives you you know all the information that you can read about poe's life but it's performed and it's you know emotionally impactful but then you also get to experience the you know stories being played out in front of you uh and it's absolutely moving i don't know if they i I think i'm sure the play is performed in other places but uh one of my favorite and it's right around the time when it's our anniversary too so it's like our our kind of like wedding anniversary date and it's like it's the best that we dress up the first time we went uh when we walked in the people at the desk asked us if we were in the play (laughs) oh (laughs) jeez that's awesome uh so yeah when we saw we saw Jekyll and Hyde back when it was on Broadway, like a million years ago, and we were so dressed up and, you know, because we're thinking, like, it's the theater, you know, it's Saturday yeah. at night, yeah. it's time to bust out your best outfit. And people in the lobby were kind of, like, looking at us, like, curiously, like, why are these people just standing around? Right. Waiting and for then you to, like, start acting or something. Somebody came up to us and they were like... Are, are you going to pose for photos? Like, are you extras? We're like, oh, geez. no, we're not, like, no, we're not, ec- like, no. <laughs> See, I would say yes and charge them money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah it, nah, it might have been smart, but. Yeah, I saw 
many years ago, and it kills me because I can't remember the person's name. There's an old historical house in the northern part of Manhattan, and they did like a parlor reading. They had a guy dressed mm -hmm. like Poe. He even kind of looked like Poe, and he was just sitting and reciting parts of the poems, parts of the story, interspersed with almost Poe talking to his mother and talking to his wife, mm -hmm. like, you know, beyond. And it was this candlelit room. And I wish I could oh, remember right. this man's name because it was ages ago. They never had him back. And he was just absolutely wonderful. I would love to see him perform again, but I think I may have seen him maybe in my junior year of high school. I think he did come to Yakima at one point <laughs> um, when around that time. And I think I went with uh, one of my good friends to appreciate that event. But it was not quite the same venue that you were describing, but it may have been the same guy. Yeah, I even called the place and I was like, you know, you did this a million years ago. Do you remember? I, it was when my partner and I were first dating, so it was mm -hmm. really long. And they were mm -hmm. like, "No, we don't. We don't have anybody who's from then who still works here." Oh. We have ourselves convinced that the man's name was Kevin, but that doesn't really do a lot of good on Google. So. No, nah, not at all. So, See, listeners I, I of Cemetery enough. Confessions, if you know who this man is, please. <laughs> Find him now. Find him. Let Dial us know. this number. I would like to. I, I would email, like to I'll stalk you know. him. <laughs> I mean, I would pay him to sit in my house and and just read Poe. He was so good. Me too. Uh, all right. Well, we'll just end with this with this question because I hear it a lot and we've talked about it before. But it's the contention that if uh, if Poe were around today, he would be a goth. What do you guys think about that? Hell yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I keep thinking I about that South Park I episode. <laughs> I know. Oh, God. I do too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Um, I definitely think he would be a goth. He definitely has that sensibility that speaks goth. But on top of that, he is a happy, bubbly person, as I know most goths are. A lot of people don't realize that. They think, ooh, fuck my life. <laughs> Woe is me. That kind of guy. And hes he totally wasn't like that. He liked to come up with puns. And he had an amazing sense of humor. And he liked to joke around with his friends. And I really think that he would be a goth by today's standards. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure he would necessarily call himself goth but if if he were to to pick a social group i think he would fit in i don't you know i it's the hard part is is deciding if he would enjoy goth music or not because uh, i don't know um but i definitely think he would find i'm not i'm trying to think of some other community where he would feel you know well now home. he might not be and so I'm, upset because people don't die of consumption anymore so <laughs> yeah, have less to write about <laughs> oh my god that was funny could you imagine poe writing um a, a, a story about Trump? oh my oh lord <laughs> the horror yeah that would be truly horrific oh my. <laughs> um all right so so to, to close out the segment here uh if I, I wanted to get some so for someone like me or someone listening who maybe only understood half of what we talked about uh if you could recommend some kind of uh some starting points something something to read uh some like basic good something that'll capture a goth's attention that they'll enjoy reading and is kind of an entry into gothic literature if I were to recommend a handful for people to start out, I would obviously recommend Poe. Um, Lord Byron, I would recommend. Charles Baudelaire, I would recommend. Um, as far as like full-blown novels go, I'd, um, it is a long book, but I would recommend The Hunchback of Notre Dame, The Monk. The Monk is very yeah. intense and fast-paced, so I think that would resonate with a lot of uh goth 
readers. Also, Frankenstein is great. Uh, Dracula is great, even though he sucks at keeping time with most of the parts of his book, but it's still an awesome story. Um... He does suck. He's Dracula. <laughs> You my, walked into that's, that one, that's my Great. that's my pun for I'm, the day. I'm cutting. That no, out of this do show. not cut that. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it. That was great. Okay. Um. Yeah, that's a pretty good introductory list, I think, of gothic works for people who are just getting into it. Sorry, I would. I'm kicking. I'm on mute. I'm kicking my son out of the. I, I heard his little um, like daddy. <laughs> I heard He's that so too. Cute. <laughs> Uh, okay, awesome. So, Adrian, thank you so much for coming Well, on. thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Michelle, thanks for hanging out again. Thank you. Um, Lygia Resurrected on YouTube. Do you have any other, uh, anywhere else you want to point people? Or I think that's kind of the center for your... That is pretty much the center of my social media world. However, you can also follow me on Instagram, Lygia Resurrected. I think that's all one word. Mm-hmm. And I'm also on Tumblr as well. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you guys again uh, so much for hanging out. I really appreciate it. Oh, actually, wait. Can I put in a few recommendations? I missed uh, that. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, Go right ahead. Okay, so I wanted to recommend Jane Eyre, which is my personal favorite. Wuthering Heights as well. Really, anything you can read by the Brontes, who I think were the OG goth chicks of their day. So OG. Um... And I'm actually going to recommend a modern book. Um, It was recently written, maybe within the past 10 years, but it is one of the best books that I have ever read. I've read it a few times. It's called The Thirteenth Tale, and it's by Diane Setafried, and it's absolutely amazing. Oh, it's so good. You're going to love it. It's one of those books you, you just don't want to get to the end. It has a lot of elements of Jane Eyre, but it's nowhere near like a carbon copy. It's a little bit Jane Eyre. The heroine ever so slightly has a Catherine Moreland aspect to her, but she's much smarter. Um, but she does get swept up into this mystery that she's hearing being told to her. It's just, it's an absolutely amazing book. And I also recommend that everybody read at least the first four of The Vampire Chronicles. So, Interview with the Vampire, The Vampire Lestat, Queen of the Damned, and A Tale of the Body Thief. Those four, I think, absolutely... Have you read the new one? I am still trying to make my way through Prince Lestat. It is... It's special. (laughs) I I just... I, I love Lestat so much, but it's... It's a little difficult to, to get through. Um, and also the first... The first book of the Mayflower, Mayfair Witches, um, The Witching Hour, is just an incredible, incredible book for, you know, I mean, to me, like, nothing beats the atmosphere. I mean, you want to talk atmosphere. Nothing beats the atmosphere that she gets in The Witching Hour. And, of course, everybody should read Dracula. Everybody, everybody, everybody should read, read Dracula. So you've got to be interested in death. It's the last great taboo. It's the only taboo left. Precisely. I mean, why is it, do you think, that everyone in here is dressed in black? It's a celebration of death. No, I just like the clothes. Mm. Yeah, well, no, I mean, <laughs> the clothes look good. Yeah, I mean, death looks good. Charles Manson, yeah? No, he was cool. Mm. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but I'm actually a vampire. <laughs> Sinister suggestions. Well, going on the gothic literature theme, I wanted to uh, as well theme my sinister suggestion this month, and it's going to be for another video game. Uh, I know that kind of limits the audience for those of you who do and don't play video games, but my suggestion this month is a game called Darkest Dungeon, and I'm actually playing it currently. It's a roguelike turn-based RPG uh, about the psychological stresses of adventuring. Uh, Basically, what you do is you recruit 
adventurers, you train them, and you lead them through a series of dungeons, uh, very Lovecraftian horrors, and a very Lovecraftian story, and it 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 oozes uh, gothic. Uh, the, there's a narrator that has this incredibly ominous, deep voice that the narration is... Uh, very archaic in its language. Uh, your characters, y- the gameplay itself, you get to choose how you use your characters. You can either um, discard them uh, as they break and as they uh, gain these terrible diseases and these character flaws, or you can spend resources trying to rehabilitate them. Uh, the the atmosphere of the game and the visuals of the game are very dark and very gothic, very reminiscent of uh, haunted castles of old and sort of um, eldritch terrors and, and those kinds of things. So I definitely recommend that game. It's a very difficult game, but... Uh, I'm really enjoying it, and it's certainly uh, something that a fan of gothic literature or gothic film would enjoy. Next month, we're going to be interviewing William Faith, most notably of Faith and the Muse, or at least most well-known from Faith and the Muse, and his wife, Scary Lady Sarah, two very ardent supporters of the local scene here and two people who have been uh, inveterate in the goth scene and have been in the goth scene for a very long time. So that's going to be great. We will, of course, be discussing some news and reviewing an album with a guest as well. So thank you for listening. If you enjoy the show... Please consider supporting us on Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash cemetery confessions to see what kind of rewards you can get. If you can't support us on Patreon, uh, at least try and uh, subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review on iTunes, uh, or just tell a friend about the show. That's, you know, get the word out there. That uh, is a big help as well. Thank you again for listening. I am the Count. We will be back next month with a new episode of Cemetery Confessions. Until then, stay dark. The preceding program is a member of The Belfry, a network of blogs, podcasts, and videos for the darkly inclined. Go to thebelfry.rip for more information. The problem with doing the end of the show at the beginning is when it actually gets edited together, usually the beginning of the show I sound really drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a bit confusing for people listening. And then at the end of the show, I sound much more sober. Uh, okay. But that's all right. Okay, so I will... Um, come on, can I make this bigger? That's what she said. Okay, God. Now, see, every... <laughs> You'd well, think we were drunk already. <laughs> it's going to be I'm all sorry. dick jokes from here on out. Oh, I took a Benadryl and poured myself a hefty glass of wine, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> nice. Uh, well, no, that's fine. We'll have some good bloopers for the end of the show. Uh, okay, I will... Oh, and also, Adrian, I know... Okay, well, let's talk about happy things. Um, okay. <laughs> so, or, I guess, really morose and not happy things. <laughs> so, Aw, but that's more um, fun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, so I will uh, pause for 20 seconds to for editing purposes, and then I will jump into the little introduction I have here, and uh, we'll just oh, we got to do uh, Audacity. Oh. oh, yeah, you're right. I totally forgot. Um, okay, so I'll count down from three. Everybody have their thing up? Mm-hmm. All right. Yes. Three, two, one. Okay. Um... I said, does everybody have their thing up? <laughs> Teehee. Oh, yeah. Okay, sure. I totally caught that. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. 
I'd put too much water in this absinthe. It tastes more like lemonade than anything. I'm going to have to fix that here in a second. Um, what okay. kind is it? It's uh, St. George, so I don't even... That's actually the same type I'm drinking. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I've got... I've, it's been a while since I made absinthe, so I forgot how much what the ratio is. But um, Okay, three...